everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? You guys hear me okay? Good. Mic check, good. All right. My name is Dane. I am uh, doing the School of Theology here with Pastor Wayne. So as part of that, he invites me to do a message once a quarter or so. So I'm very blessed uh, to be up here again with you guys. We are diving into our series on the book of Mark. And this morning, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 10, the first part of that chapter. So Jesus covers a lot of ground. Um, he talks about divorce. He also talks about rich men not being able to enter heaven. And uh, I thought, okay, divorce and rich men, I can only screw that up. Thank you, good night. So I'm not going to take on both of those. Um, I feel like God is really calling me this morning to kind of dive into uh, divorce. And in Jesus' response to a very pointed question from the Pharisees, we're going to unpack some of Genesis and look at the marriage covenant. So I'm really, really excited to dive into that. Um, not just because I have a total rock star relationship with my wife, Carrie. Um, we've been very blessed, but it is the goal for Carrie and I that people that we come in contact with, people that we know, love, and care about, um, they see that the strength of our marriage is not based on our strength. The strength of our marriage is really based on the fact that we put God at the center and that we fall short. We're not perfect, but we grow and adapt to God together, and that's why we have such a strong marriage. So, that being said, uh, let's open up. We're in Mark 10, 1. We see that uh, Jesus and the disciples, they leave Capernaum. They go down to Judea. And at this point, um, word is spread about Jesus. So whenever he stops and starts to talk and address people, a crowd forms. Whenever he enters town, people kind of storm him. So, of course, every time we see when Jesus addresses the public like that, there's always a detractor in the crowd. There's always someone that wants to question his authority or try and trip him up or try and capture him. So again, we see our old friends, the Pharisees, the religious leadership. Uh, so who here has seen Seinfeld? Who used to watch Seinfeld? Okay, you guys remember Jerry's nemesis, Newman? He used to say, oh, Newman. That's the Pharisees. So they show up again, and they throw this very pointed legalistic question at him and say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? All right. Well, first of all, Jesus lets us into a secret to success in life. He answers their question with a question. He buys himself some time. That's actually really, really effective if you're talking with people and witnessing, and they throw you something that ruffles your feathers. Slow down, answer a question with a question. So Jesus responds to the Pharisees and says, what did Moses command you? He points to the truth of God's word. And the Pharisees say, well, you know, he allowed it. He said it's fine. Uh, so a little background context. At this point um, in Judaism, there were two schools of thought on marriage. The more liberal school, taking a part of Deuteronomy out of context, basically says you can divorce your wife anytime, any reason. You know, she burned the brisket, or you find a more attractive woman, or like anything goes. It, it was getting pretty out of control. Um, so Jesus clarifies and says, look, it's because of the hardness of your heart that Moses gave you that commandment. Because of the hardness of your heart. Not because it's a good thing or a good idea, um, but it's because of our fallen sinful nature. So in other words, sometimes people are going to fall short and violate that covenant, and in that case, there's an exception. God reluctantly gave us an out. So divorce is a reluctant exception to God's divine purpose and plan for the marriage covenant. Um, in Matthew 19, we're looking at the exact same moment. Jesus actually expands upon that and says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, sexual immorality, it makes sense that in a covenant and a contract, a righteous and a just God would allow an out for when the contract is violated. But again, um, later we also see it was tradition that um, followers of rabbis would not challenge their rabbis in the public square. So right after this interaction with the Pharisees, the disciples ask Jesus again, and he clarifies and says, look, it's not when the going gets tough or because feelings change, you find someone better, except for sexual immorality. If you leave, you're violating the covenant. That's the, that's the only excuse. So um, in responding to the Pharisees, however, he asks, what did Moses command you? They think he's talking about Deuteronomy. In reality, he's talking about Genesis. And Jesus unpacks Genesis 2, the second half of Genesis 2, and goes right back to our origins, and he ties the importance of the marriage covenant right to when it all started, when God created Adam and Eve. So in Mark 10, 6, Jesus responds, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. God made them male and female. Boy, is that a provocative statement on some college campuses these days. Holy cow, I'm going to come back to that. 
Um, <laughs> Genesis 2.24, God made them male and female. So here we see the authority of God. God made them male and female. God created us. So we are the direct creative act by a sovereign creator. That means that God has total authority over us. Jesus continues, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, something new is created. There's some transformation there. Has, has marriage changed you? Are you the same as before you got married? For better or for worse, right? It's a, it's a, but it's a good thing in the long run, right? All right. So the second thing we see here is, is order out of chaos. Um, I thought it was really interesting when I looked at Genesis 2. After Adam names all the animals, he's like, hey, there's no one like me. They're all on their hind legs. What's going on? And God says, all right, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make you a helper. I will make you a companion. But before the marriage covenant is inaugurated, God recognizes and says to Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. So God created in us a need we cannot meet. I think that is a pretty cool foreshadowing of the cross and what Jesus accomplishes in our eventual reliance on Christ. Um, and what a wonderful failsafe against pride and self-reliance. Again, again you know, we need a helper. We need a companion. You can't do it on your own. Um, there is no way on God's green earth in the last five years I would have accomplished anything near what we did without Carrie. There's no way. Um, I'm, in, I'm in total awe when I, when I think back um, on the last couple of years in our lives, in the first five years of our marriage. We've been incredibly blessed. Um, and just the daily stuff too, right? Like last night I'm going out to walk the dog and I put the flashlight in my back pocket and then I leash the dog and I'm like, babe, where's the flashlight? It's in your back pocket. Okay, love you. I'll be back. I mean, like I you know, couldn't find my shirt. So <laughs> we need a companion. We need a helper. God created order um, out of chaos. So Jesus says, let therefore... What God has joined together, let not man separate. That is the covenant. That is the commitment that God created. So if we look at that verse in context, we also see right alignment. That again, God's authority were the result of a creative act. God creates order out of chaos with the marriage covenant. Um, and he has dominion over us. We become one flesh. We become a new creation. So um, when we enter the marriage covenant, it provides order and stability. Um, but as well, when we're correctly, correctly aligned under God, that is how God stewards his purposes from one generation to the next. In the raising of children and the ushering in the family into society and ordering civilization, that is how God accomplishes his purposes in human history. Marriage is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, but it's not just that. The other thing that I wanted to look at and dive in on was uh, Paul's words on marriage, where he also illustrates, we're going to go to Ephesians 5, um, Paul illustrates the second important feature of the marriage covenant, um, and that is that it is a reflection of Christ's love for the church. So um, if you guys want to open up to Ephesians 5, I remember last year, Gene shared with us a great way to navigate the Bible. It's to the right of Mark, GEP, General Electric Power Company. If you land on Galatians, Ephesians, or Philippians, you're good. You're there. So Ephesians 5.21. Um, is Vanessa here? Vanessa actually read this at her wedding, at our wedding for me and Carrie. I don't know. If she's here. She, could she come on up? Carrie, can you come on up? I thought we'd do a little vow renewal before the baby gets here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Carrie's like, divorce, divorce. I'm not getting up there. Just kidding. Um, so in Ephesians uh, 20, uh, 5, 21, we see Paul elaborates on the marriage covenant. And he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your, hu your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water throughout the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So there also, Paul quotes Genesis at the end, 
but he's unpacking a really important concept that the purpose of the marriage covenant in human history is also to illustrate the love that Christ had for the church. So what's different about love in a kingdom marriage versus love in a worldly marriage? Well, there should be an element of sacrifice, right? It's sacrificial love. It's not what do I get? Am I going to be personally fulfilled? It's what can I give up? What can I do for you to help you? Um, So love in a kingdom marriage is supposed to be a reflection of Christ's love for us. So ask yourself that question daily, weekly, monthly. What are you giving up? What are you sacrificing for the good of your spouse? I'm not talking about you gave up a career or you didn't move to this place you really wanted to go to. Um, I'm talking about little big stuff, little things consistently that mean that much to your partner. So I'll give you guys a great example. Um, Monday through Friday, Carrie and I are pretty much on the same wavelength. We try and get a lot of stuff done. Um, And then Saturday mornings, we are completely different. Saturday mornings, I get up, make my coffee, let the dog out. We watch an episode of some Saturday morning cartoon from the 80s. I'm an only child, so usually Ghostbusters or Ninja Turtles. I switch it up. We watch our cartoon, and then I like to detail the cars. I like to go ride my motorcycle, and I like to go hit the gym. That's like my Saturday morning. I love getting all that stuff done. But especially in the last eight months, Carrie is very different. On Saturdays, she likes to relax and decompress and get some R&R and not be super busy and super caught up. So the last couple months during the pregnancy, I've kind of let my Saturday morning routine go. For example, prepping for this message the other day, on the couch with the laptop, quality time. Not a big deal. I can go to the gym Friday night instead of Saturday morning, and that absolutely means the world to her. So that's an example. Look for little big stuff. What can you give up for the good of your spouse? Sacrificial love, the way that that Christ loved the church. That's definitely a secret uh, to success in the marriage. So that being said, um, marriage is certainly an institution uh, under attack, um, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, That's not a new thing, by the way. When I looked into Genesis where Jesus was quoting, I thought it was really interesting that at the end of Genesis 2, God inaugurates the marriage covenant, and then not a line goes by. Genesis 3, 1, and the devil was a crafty beast of the field. The second God unites Adam and Eve in marriage, the devil's like, wait a minute. I can't let that stand. I got to go after that. I can't let God accomplish his purposes in human history. The devil waited until Adam and Eve were married to go after them and cause the fall. Really, really interesting. So, That being said, I think it's helpful when we are talking with other uh, non-Christian couples or when we're witnessing to people or when we're trying to share the love of a good and a godly marriage, we kind of have to understand what the enemy has done throughout the arc of human history, what the devil's done um, to try and keep derailing God's purposes and God's plans. So um, again, Satan caused the fall in the garden. He was really the first rebel, right? Rebel, radicalize, resist. Where do we hear that today? Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, So (laughs) he causes us to fall in the garden, and then uh, that doesn't work out too well for humanity. It gets so bad that God has to flood the earth. And after the flood, there is a man named Nimrod who comes from the line of Noah who builds Babylon and says, ha, I could build a better kingdom down here. We don't need God. Next big radical in human history. And then things go okay for the rest of the Old Testament. Jesus shows up and he accomplishes his purposes, praise God, salvation. He takes the weight that we were, we were supposed to take. And then after that, we have the Reformation and the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. So there's this amazing era of prosperity for humanity. But right around the time of the Industrial Revolution, there's another rebel. A guy named Carl wrote a manifesto. Didn't like all that prosperity that humanity was going through. So those ideas get played out politically and economically in the 20th century, and humanity almost extinguishes itself twice. Three times if you count the Cold War. Not good. And now in the 21st century, what we're seeing is those ideas are becoming really popular again. Rebel, radicalize, resist. Kids, you can be your own God. You are the sole determiner and arbiter of truth. It's a very toxic and dangerous way to live your life, and it's why so many people are lost, and it's why so many people are struggling today. So why did I even bring that up? We have to understand that we're shining the light of God and trying to radically love people. When we tell them the truth, the truth is going to ruffle feathers. People are going to be offended, but the person's reaction to the truth does not change the truth. Another way to say what I just said is that in the modern era, 
there was general agreement about some universal truths. So in other words, there was right and wrong, there was up and down, there was left and right, and marriage was a good thing to order society and to raise children for the health of a country or a civilization. Um, but that is not a really popular view right now. That's a pretty, uh, pretty <laughs> unpopular thing to say. So if we're gonna radically love people, I believe that we have to tell them the truth, but don't miss opportunities because you're worried about offending people. You're, you're gonna ruffle some feathers, and we have these conversations without pride, without arrogance, but um, some people are gonna be offended, so I want you guys to be ready for that. Um, and really, again, modernism, Judeo-Christian values, there was the truth, there was an established external moral order, and then today, since the late 60s or so, we're in what scholars and theologians are referring to as postmodernism. Postmodernism just means that today there's no truth but my opinion. And if you talk to people for long enough, you'll see that a lot of young people are, you know, you say the sky's blue, I say the sky's red, and both have to be equally valid. So things have gotten pretty crazy out there. Um, it's really important that we understand that when we start talking to people and witnessing to people about what makes our marriage is different, what makes our relationships healthy, and we try and love on them. So that being said, um, yeah, Jesus said, I came not to bring peace but a sword. So love on people without judgment, without arrogance, but expect to ruffle some feathers. Um, it's important to understand that today, the goal and the purpose of marriage to a lot of people is really just individual fulfillment and happiness, and that's how people view the institution. So what happens is, when the feelings change, after the honeymoon's over, the first rough patch or the first trial or the first time the going gets tough and the feeling change, that undermines the foundation completely. And people say, well, maybe they're not my soulmate. Maybe I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. This is, you know, and then that's, that's why so many people are splitting up today. That's the worldly cultural view of marriage. What can I get? What do I get out of it? And when that changes, when my feeling change, I'm going to go take myself down the road. Thank you so much. This, this just isn't working out. That's complete and total contrast to God's purpose for the marriage covenant. Love in a godly marriage comes from the commitment. It comes from saying, look, this has just as much to do with duty and promise as it has to do with my feelings or my passions or my needs being met. That's super, super important. Um, so it's a covenant and a commitment and love in a godly marriage says, look, I made a commitment to you and things might get rough. We might, have, we might hit a couple bumps along the way. I'm committed to you, I'm not going anywhere. That's very, very different than the worldly and the cultural way to view marriage today. So the strength of love in the marriage covenant is derived from the commitment, not necessarily from feelings. Are feelings and passion important? Sure, of course they are. That's how bambinos get here, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's important. Um, but more importantly, we have, to look, we have to understand that people that we're going to be talking to are going to be viewing marriage very, very differently than the way that we're trying to represent it. So marriage, again, order and alignment under God, order out of chaos, stability. It is how God stewards his purposes from one generation to the next, and it's how he brings about good in society. That's, that's how I feel personally. So I wanted to click off a couple points for a strong marriage since we're on the topic. That being said, again, commitment, then feelings. Um, this, if you keep your focus on the commitment that you made to your spouse, again, everyone likes to be part of something bigger than themselves. Um, I view this as the best aspect of the marriage covenant because if you make the commitment what you revere and what you respect and what you say, wow, look at what we've accomplished, look at what we've done together, I made a commitment to this person, God will hedge and protect you against the small stuff in life molehills don't turn into mountains. You don't have big knockdown, drag out fights where someone moves into a hotel for a week, right? Um, one of the greatest things God has done in me as a man since I married Carrie is humbled me. My pride and arrogance have gone like this. You know, we'll still go at each other if we're tired or ornery, we've had a long week, but it's not a big blow up explosion and Holy Spirit always convicts me, usually within minutes to be like, yep, you know what, sorry babe. Had a long day, nothing to do with you, I'm sorry. Um, so when you make the commitment the object of your feelings, it, God will protect you. God will protect you and strengthen um, that relationship. So that being said, um, this is particularly apropos for newlyweds, um, you're on the same team. You gotta remember, you guys are on the same team. Um, I am very blessed in that my parents are awesome and my in-laws are awesome too, so this is not us. 
But I have seen again and again with other couples we know that there's always like a helpful family member or a friend that kind of tries to get in between the new couple. Um, and that, that's not a good thing, guys. Once that covenant is inaugurated, it's just going to be you two, okay? You're on the same team. Um, so part of that covenant and commitment also means we respect each other, right? So ladies, don't be airing out your, dirty, your man's dirty laundry when you're out with your girlfriends. That's not good. And the same thing goes for us, guys. When we're watching the game, don't be airing out a, you know, a list of all her flaws and things that drive you nuts. You're supposed to respect one another and have each other's backs. There should never be a question in your spouse's mind as to whether or not you have their back. That's super, super important. You're on the same team. Um, that being said, this one's big. You gotta do the work, guys. You have to do the work. You have to take time to invest in the relationship. For Carrie and I, that's Thursday nights is date night. We usually go to Mel's Diner. I've mentioned Mel's before up here. Um, again, it, you have to invest time to goal set and vision and say, hey, look at where we've been and look what God did. And yeah, it got tough, but God delivered us out of that circumstance and celebrate one another. So we have an awesome opportunity to be able to do that here. Uh, on Monday nights, we have our five love languages. So if you guys are interested in getting plugged in and taking some time and being intentional and strengthening your marriage and your walk with God with your spouse, that would be a really, really good thing um, to get plugged in on. So we highly recommend that. Check out the, Co the Connection Center after the service. So, in summary, God's prescription for the marriage covenant, order, alignment, stability, it's how God ushers his purposes into human history through us. Very, very important. So, that being said, um, share your story with other couples. If you feel, see people that are struggling, or maybe they're not struggling, they're just treading water, they're not really going anywhere, talk to people about how you put God at the center of your marriage. Why is it lasting? Why is it enduring? Why do you guys always seem to be doing great? Um, get out there and don't worry about ruffling feathers and offending people. Shine that light. The world needs that right now, specifically more, more than ever at this time in human history. It, it is getting crazy out there. So that being said, I wanted to kind of close with a story and talk about what's at stake. What's at stake if we don't look for those opportunities where God calls us to shine light and say, hey, this is what God calls us to. This is why you need a partner. This is why you need a companion. Um, so many of you know that um, Carrie and I in our office, we do a lot of pediatric work. Um, we take care of anyone, anyone with a nervous system. We take care of whoever. But we do a lot of work in pediatrics. Um, and about a year and a half ago, I joined a really awesome organization, and we powwow once a quarter in San Diego, trainings, conferences, and stuff like that. And the first training that I went to, um, I met a young girl named Rachel at our first breakout session, coffee and snacks and all that. And um, we were going for the cream at the same time. And I said, like, oh, no, 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 you go ahead, go ahead. And she introduced herself, and they, she had just gotten licensed, and she and her husband were looking to open a practice in Wisconsin, but he hadn't gotten licensed yet. So I thought, oh, well, same thing happened to me and Carrie. You know, you guys will be fine. Um, and then we went back into the morning session and went to lunch, and I didn't see her again until the afternoon when I hit the jackpot. We did a small group breakout, groups of 15 or 20 people, and I got to be in the room upstairs with Dr. David Jackson, the guy who started the organization. So I was really, really excited. I had my pen and paper ready to go. I was amped. And we sit down in, in tables in the afternoon session, and Dr. David starts us off with this sort of you know, positive psychology type of an exercise. Like, what are your strengths? What are your fears? Let's get those down on paper before we start. So I'm like, all right, you know, communication's pretty good. Like, fears, what do you, okay, there's payroll and there's overhead. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, and I noticed, oh, holy cow, there's Rachel. She's right at my table, right next to me. I was so focused on listening to this guy. I didn't even see, oh, hey, what's up? How's it going? So about five minutes into the topic, Dr. Jackson is talking, and Rachel starts, her arms start shaking. And I'm like, are you, like, what's, and then her leg starts twitching under the table. And then she gets up and bolts out of the room. And I was like, okay, what, what's up with that? What's going on? I look over at her paper, um, and I don't remember exactly, I'll paraphrase. Under the fears column, she wrote down something like, no one will value me because I'm not lovable. It was something just, oh, man, that hit me hard. It was uh, to see someone else in pain like that, inwardly withdrawn, that was suffering silently like that. It was, it was awful. Um, so she, she left the room, and of course, Holy Spirit, right? 
I, I just I hear in my head, go help her. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I spent a lot of time to get here. I took a, a weekend away from Carrie. I'm listening to Dr. Jackson. I can't do that. So I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, I stayed in that room for about 10, 15 minutes. I kept taking notes. <laughs> God, again, second time, louder, go help her. Okay, okay. Pen down. I leave the room. She's pacing frantically in the hallway, like trying to, trying to calm herself down. And I walk up to her and I say, Rachel, this is going to sound really weird. Um, I have been a Christian since March of 2010, and I feel very strongly that God wanted me to come up to you and say, number one, you are valuable. Number two, you are loved. And number three, you're going to do great things in your practice. And of course, she breaks down into tears, and I'm like, oh, crap, no, 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 that's not what I, okay, um, just, why don't you clean yourself up, grab, grab a glass of water, and um, when we, the afternoon's done, dinner's on me, we'll go talk some more, okay? So after the sessions were done for the day, we went, uh, it was San Diego, so we grabbed some tacos, um, and I let her talk, and she reveals that they've been married for about four months, and because her husband hasn't been granted his license, the state is really taking the time on the paperwork, he's getting really frustrated. And that is causing a communication breakdown in their marriage because he's getting you know, really just easy and irritable and just they, they are, they're fighting all the time and they don't know where they're going to open. They don't know how they're going to fund the practice the first couple months. So major communication breakdown, major, major stress and overwhelm, not a good place for newlyweds to be. So when she's done talking, I just tell her my story and I talk about what was, what's different about our relationship and our marriage and how we always fall short and we always screw up and that's okay because we grow closer to God together. We adapt when we fall short. It's not about us. The strength of our marriage is not based on our strength. If we did that, like the world is doing, like the culture is telling us to, that's a recipe for disaster. So the last thing I said to her was, Rach, when you get home, you have to go find a church. And she says, that's really funny because three weeks ago, Sunday morning, we had the worst fight we've ever had. And I'm pretty sure, I was pretty sure we were gonna get divorced. So I grab my coat and I take the car and I leave and I'm crying so hard that I pull into a parking lot so I don't crash. And when I pulled myself together, I looked up and it was the parking lot of a church. And I said, Rachel, that's where God is telling you to go. When you get back, you have to take him and you have to go there and find someone and they will help you. And so we exchanged numbers and we stayed in touch and they did. And they opened their office and this is them today. This is them now. December 18th, they had their first child and they are doing great. I believe for a reason that God made the windshield bigger than the rear view mirror. I don't like to live in the past. And I, I'm not a man with fears and regrets, but when I can't sleep at night, things that haunt me, what would have happened if I hadn't left the room? What opportunities are we missing because we're worried about ruffling feathers and offending others? You do it with humility, without judgment, but when someone is struggling, you go at them and you say, look, look, look. Look over here. There's an answer over here. It's okay. God loves you. So, that being said, if there is anyone in this room that is suffering in silence, if your relationship or your marriage is at an impasse and you're trying to hide it, you're trying to cover it up, and you are struggling, that's what the app's for. Don't wait. Shoot one of the pastors a message today. The enemy wants you to withdraw in isolation and let that stuff fester so he can destroy. Don't let that happen. If you are struggling, ask for help. Okay? That being said, if you are in a happy, committed, <laughs> godly marriage and things are going well, I would highly, highly suggest that at some point today, take a moment to remember the wedding day. Take a moment to remember the covenant and the commitment and the strength that you've drawn out of that commitment to your spouse over the years. Take a minute to celebrate that, guys. That's amazing. God is using us in human history. The third thing I'd recommend, and this is very rewarding if you, if you can do it, find another couple to mentor. Find another couple to love on, okay? Don't, let's not everyone try and mentor Dave and Carly, okay? We can't, <laughs> we can't all go after them. The one person will draw straws, they get them, okay? But um, share, share what makes your marriage different. 
Share the fact you put God at the center. All you have to do is point them towards Jesus, and God will take care of the rest. All right? Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.